Nestled in the top corner of the United States, there's a conference of college football teams responsible for founding the most popular sport this country has to offer, football. These institutions played in only the most regal of stadiums, designed to mimic the same arenas gladiators and Olympians competed in during the Greek and Roman empires. They were titans of the sport. No one stood in comparison. But then, everything changed. A conference once full of national champions and All-Americans now sits all alone in the world of college football. Never talked about, never given any mind. The Ivy League story with football is a unique case because they have all the building blocks to be an elite conference. But even with the power they possess, they have made the active decision to remain in obscurity. In this video, we are going to analyze the rise and fall of the Ivy League and explore what can be done to bring the sleeping giant of a conference back to greatness. Even before the United States existed as a country, seven of the eight schools that would go on to form the Ivy League were already chartered and well on their way to becoming the nation's frontrunners in academia. These schools were also trailblazers in the world of college sports. Yale formed a boat club in 1843, which was technically the first ever college sports team, and Harvard gave them someone to race against a year later. Cornell became the first American college to compete in track in 1873, and Princeton competed in the first ever football game against Rutgers in 1869. The rules were a little bit different though since the sport was in its infancy. There were 25 players on each team, the ball was round, there wasn't a line of scrimmage, it was just an ongoing game, and teams scored not by running into the end zone, but by kicking a ball into a goal. It was soccer. It was just a really crappy version of soccer. It wouldn't be until a lot more teams joined the sport for it to start to take shape. By 1887, all the Ivy Leagues had a team and were responsible for major reforms to the game. Harvard introduced aspects of rugby to the game, like the touchdown, 11-man roster, and egg-shaped football. Yale and Princeton established the concept of the line of scrimmage and the snap, and Ivy League alumni John Heisman and Pop Warner revolutionized the game as coaches, introducing things like the forward pass and the three-point stance. With this sort of prowess in the new sport, the Ivy Leagues were consistently at the top for the first several decades of college football. Even though they weren't officially in a conference together yet, they regularly scheduled games against each other and drew some of the biggest crowds in the country. Every year from 1880 to 1913, one of these eight schools claimed a national title. The Ivy stayed competitive into the 40s, but as football grew in popularity, other universities started offering athletic scholarships. This was great for the sport, since it went from something students just enjoyed playing in their free time to an opportunity for kids to receive a free education if they played well enough on the field. For the academically elite though, this posed a threat, or it at least seemed like a threat that athletic scholarships would bring in less intelligent students and would tarnish their academic prestige. So in 1945, the eight universities in the Northeast that shared the same culture of scholastic excellence officially formed into a conference and banned any of their members from offering athletic scholarships. The attitude that the Ivies held was that they didn't need scholarship players to stay at the same level as other Division I schools. And they were right. From 1945 to 1995, they amassed 37 total NCAA national championships across all their sports. That's not half bad, until you look at what sports they won them in. While there were a handful of natties in popular and accessible sports like hockey and swimming, over half of these championships were in fencing probably the most upper crust and exclusive sport to exist in college sports. In football though, things went immediately downhill. 1947 would be the last year the conference saw two teams finish the season ranked, and 1970 was the last year they even had one team finish in the AP or coaches poll. The schools were very picky with who they chose for their non-conference opponents, oftentimes choosing worse opponents with closer cultures to the Ivy League, and turned down bowl game bids so that their student athletes could study more. <coughs> nerds. The isolation caused even undefeated teams to be overlooked by the rest of the country, and as a result, attendance dwindled. In 1981, the NCAA lopped off the Ivy League along with other struggling schools from Division 1A, demoting them to Division 1AA, which is now known as the FCS. The Ivy League was given an opportunity to add a couple more schools to their conference to meet the new attendance requirements to stay in the FBS, but with so many rules they require of all their schools, no one was willing to join and lose all their scholarship players and bowl bids. Even since joining the ranks of the FCS, the Ivy League has continued to struggle. 
In a 1981 article from a Dartmouth school newspaper, the author noted that their average attendance that year of 13,000 fans per game was disappointing, but in today's age, that would be well above average for the conference. In 2023, Dartmouth averaged just 3,200 fans, even when they were conference co-champions. With postseason play still banned in the Ivy League and academic pressure at an all-time high for students, the culture of football has died at these schools. Like, why would you spend an entire afternoon watching a meeting game when you have homework to do, clubs to participate in, and internships to apply to. Even the stadiums themselves have seen a consistent decline. We can see how the conference rose to power with massive additions these schools made to the stadiums in the early 20th century. But ever since Harvard chopped their stadium in half in 1952, it's been bad news for the entire conference. Compare that to the consistent upward trend of other schools' facilities in the region, and it's pretty clear how much of a divergence the league has made from the rest of the NCAA. It's really sad to see how the schools that founded the sport now have close to zero interest in it today. But this isn't just a story of unfortunate events. It was well within their control to change with the times and grow alongside all the other historic programs, but the conference chose to stand firm on their convictions to make academics paramount over everything else. Is this a noble cause? Of course, but it's not like you can't have both, you know? Duke, Vanderbilt, Northwestern, Stanford, and so many others have stayed competitive in the Power Five over the years while maintaining their status on the academic side. So there's gotta be another reason. Maybe the Ivy League's leaders are just grumpy old men that like to complain about how things aren't like they used to be. Or maybe the snobby stereotype of the schools really is true and they couldn't stand to enroll a student that wasn't a high school valedictorian. Whatever their motivation may be, it's safe to say that they're holding themselves back from their true potential to be a powerhouse in college football. They still have impressive stadiums, rich and powerful alumni, histories of unmatched success and beautiful campuses. I would argue that the Ivy League has more resources available for recruiting top talent than most Power 5 schools, but yet they've specifically chosen to nerf themselves. It's like how Lana Del Rey grew up in an extremely wealthy family and then went on to live in a trailer park just because she felt like it. I've got to be the first person ever to relate Lana Del Rey to college football. But anyways, the point is that if these schools want to be respected on the field, they have got to start using what they have to revitalize their programs. The first step to all of this is allowing athletic scholarships. I get it. You don't want some dummies at your school that are just there to play ball and have to come up with fake classes to keep them eligible, like some schools. So maybe the Ivy League still enforces academic standards for athletes, like a minimum SAT score to enroll and a higher minimum GPA to stay eligible. That way, kids know what they're signing up for, that they have to take school seriously, but they can still reap the same benefits of free tuition that they would at any other D1 program. Taking it a step further, banning postseason play for the sake of exams is weak sauce. D3 programs, which also have no scholarship players, still have exams during their playoffs and I don't see any of them skipping out on more football with the academics as their excuse. Johns Hopkins, a university with the same prestige as the Ivies in academics, have played in the D3 football playoff 12 times since 2005, and I'm sure every one of those players is more proud of those games than whatever they scored on their exams that semester. It's like the old saying goes, what are you going to remember more? Some dumb test or a chance to make history? Right now, the only motivator for players and fans in the Ivy League are rivalry games. There's no conference title game. There's no shot at a national championship or a big bowl game. It's just a 10-game season with no prize at the end of the road. And that's why fan support is abysmal in the Ivies, besides the Harvard-Yale game. Now imagine a world where that game, Harvard versus Yale, also has playoff implications on the line. Winner gets a ticket to the dance, and loser watches from home. That would create a sellout, fired up crowd, even if it wasn't the oldest rivalry in college sports. The Ivies have also got to get off their high horse and start playing more non-conference opponents. In the last three seasons, only 23 different teams have matched up against the Ivy League across 72 games, and there's only been one game with an FBS opponent, UConn. Playing a wider variety of opponents would boost their credibility as a competitive conference and would provide more interesting matchups to give fans another reason to support their team. The last immediate change that the Ivies can use to propel themselves is an extremely powerful, yet extremely controversial one. It's the black Spider-Man suit, the dark side of the force. 
the Infinity Gauntlet. And that is, you guessed it, NIL Collectives. Now listen, you hate them, I hate them, we all hate them. But in today's age of college sports, you either adapt and thrive or get left behind and die. The ability for a school to succeed in providing players with NIL money hinges upon the ability to raise money from fans and alumni. For some schools, that means having casual fans with disposable incomes. For other schools, you just have a lot of diehard supporters that will do whatever they can to stay relevant. And for a select few, it's both. For the Ivy League, it's group number one for sure. They don't have a big football culture yet, but let's look at this list of alumni. Jeff Bezos from Princeton, The Zuck and Bill Gates from Harvard, Elon Musk and Trump from Penn. The list goes on. These guys can chuck an easy million into NIL and not even notice a difference in their bank account. Would it be pretty sleazy if that's how the Ivies gained relevance? Oh, definitely, I would hate it, but I'm just saying, the opportunity is there if they want it. Now let's say there's a world where the Ivies did everything that I just listed. Pumped NIL money, opened up their schedule, allowed athletic scholarships. That would inevitably skyrocket their football program's performance and fan support. It would probably get to the point where some of the schools could even make a leap back to the FBS. Harvard, Yale, Penn, Dartmouth, and Princeton are the five schools that check the boxes in my eyes. Harvard and Yale are the flagship schools with a deep history. Dartmouth and Princeton have seen a lot of recent success with their programs, and Penn has the richest alumni and one of the coolest stadiums in all of college football. Columbia, Brown, and Cornell, on the other hand, haven't really made a name for themselves at all in recent history and have lackluster facilities, so they would probably hang back in the FCS. This would cause the conference to split in football, kind of similar to how the Big East operated in the 2000s. For all other sports, it still makes sense to stick together, but for football, the Ivy League would need to add partial members to keep an eight-team conference at both divisions. In the FBS, they would need to add three teams, Navy, Army, and UConn. Navy and Army are easy fits to the Ivy League mold since their student athletes are known for being just as committed in the classroom as they are in the field. UConn is a harder sell though because they're a public school with good but not elite academics. They are, however, the only FBS team in recent history to have played in Ivy against in-state opponent Yale, and they aren't already tied down to a conference. Boston College would probably be the better fit, but realistically, they wouldn't leave the ACC to join the Ivy League. As for the FCS branch, they need five football-only members. Well, since we just talked about how there's only 23 teams that they even bother to schedule games with, I took a look at their academic standards and tried to pick the five that I think give off the most Ivy League vibes. Colgate and Georgetown were easy picks since they are just about as selective as any of the other Ivies, but after that, the choices are a bit harder. I thought Howard could be a cool addition since they're kind of known for being the Ivy League historically black university, but pulling them out of the MEAC just felt wrong with all the history they have with all the other HBCUs and would mean they're no longer eligible to play in the Celebration Bowl. So instead, I went with Lehigh and Holy Cross, which are both private universities with historic campuses and above average academics. Like, if you kind of squint your eyes, yeah, they're kind of like Ivy League schools. The last addition I made was Villanova, because even though their last Ivy League opponent was Penn in 2016, they're a prestigious university in the Northeast, so it would make sense for them to be in this conference. Now with the Ivy League and the FBS, how would they fit into the landscape? Well, I think right off the bat, they would become public enemy number one. I mean, just think about it. Rich, elite, exclusive schools who gained relevance from the pockets of the wealthiest and most powerful people in America, and to top it off, they're all from the part of the country with the most toxic sports fans? Yeah, it wouldn't take a lot for them to get chippy between fans and players. It would also be no surprise to see these small private schools garnering a lot of fans that have no connection to the school. Believe me, bandwagon fans are the worst. Now I'm wondering if this is even a good idea to have the Ivy League come back. Like, do we really want to open Pandora's box and see them shake up everything in college football? Honestly, yeah, I kind of do. College football needs a new big villain. What about ESPN? Okay, besides ESPN. The Nick Saban era is over, as is Jim Harbaugh's, and even Dabo Sweeney has lost his mojo recently. Sure, there's still going to be plenty of heated rivalries to go around, and plenty of teams to hate on like Texas, Notre Dame, and Ohio State, but imagine if there was an entire conference of schools with targets on their back. That'd make for good TV, man. I'd want to see it. Every blue-collar public school would be foaming at the mouth to match up against the Ivies. 
playing with a chip on their shoulders like the result of a football game will determine the value of their education. Will we ever actually see the Ivy League make a legitimate comeback though? Probably not. Tradition is huge at these schools, so drastically changing their culture for the sake of college football is definitely not likely. Even still, it was fun for me to think, what if? And I hope you enjoyed it too. Let me know in the comments what you would like or not like about the Ivies joining the FBS. Just remember, if there's anything you say that I don't agree with though, I will find you. Thanks for watching. Stay safe out there.